the, uh, the, what I'm going to talk to you about today is basically I'm going to try to take you on a trip of my life and what got me to come back to Colombia after 12 years of training abroad and try to convince you that it's worth it and that you have to get really good at it. Now, of course this doesn't work. Hector, yeah. This was me. Now don't laugh. It was 1980 and I was cool back then, all right? <laughs> and just like you, I was full of energy. I wanted to take over the world. I was full of expectations and, and, and thought the world was for me to take. So I went to the Colegio Andino and uh, graduated in 1983 and was one of the top students in my class, believe it or not. I got the second best ICFIS in Colombia. Impressive, right? Well, it didn't get me into any of the universities I wanted to go to, actually, and I had to take some tests and things and, and finally got into a Rosario, which I was very happy with, and studied medicine and loved it, loved it, and decided during that time that I wanted to be a surgeon, and that I was competent enough, and I believe this in, in deep in my heart, to train in one of the top 10 programs in the U.S. Now to do that, I had to boost my CV, I had to do some academic work and, and, and fill some gaps. So I did my last two years of my training at the Fundación Santa Fe Bogotá doing research work and, and, uh, and the like. And this secured me a spot in one of the top liver transplant programs in Europe, happened to be in the UK, in this place, Birmingham. Now, Granted, it's not Miami, but it was just a stepping stone, right? So who cares if it was depressing? And it was. And there was just one minor hurdle to get over this. I had to take this test, the PLAB, Professional Linguistic Assessment Board Examination, which when I got there, I was told, listen, don't worry about it. It's just something to prove that you can speak English, and your English is actually pretty decent for a guy graduating from a German school. So I kept calm, didn't study. Took the trip up to Glasgow to take the exam. And when I got there, I found myself amidst 400 other medical graduates, mostly from India and Pakistan. And they all took this very seriously. Sure enough, the exam took three days. It was the hardest medical exam I ever took in my life. All right? English. Who cares about English? This was hard. Three days later, I went back to Birmingham, not as confident, not as sure of myself, and a few weeks later I got the results of the exam, and sure enough, they weren't that good, as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> I failed, not just failed, but it was a severe failure. And of course it was a major blow to my ego, mostly, because I felt I was a top tier student in Colombia, but I didn't understand how somebody who was fully qualified in Colombia as a medical student and then as a doctor could come to the UK and fail severely in a professional assessment examination. So Birmingham, which was a kid, just originally a stepping stone in my life to get to my major plan, became my big bang. Gave me the most important lesson of my life up to that point by showing me and making me realize that people from Pakistan, India, and other parts of the world were clearly qualified to compete on the world stage, or a side coming from Colombia simply wasn't. Now, you have to understand that back then, this was the 1990s, the world was not as flat as it is today. And proof of that is that this was my laptop. All right? That thing was a Toshiba T5100. It weighed seven and a half kilograms and had 40 megabytes of memory and it was a state of the art. All right? And internet only became available in 1995, which meant I didn't have the means you have today of connecting with people all over the world and you know, cross-referencing. So being in England at that time was a blessing like no other. I was able to be exposed to people from all over the world, cultures, intellects, abilities, and more importantly, work ethics. And realizing that, 
I decided that I was going to learn everything I could from every single one of my counterparts. And I did so for the next six months by studying six hours a day, learning how they studied, what they studied, and how they had gotten where they had gotten. I took the test and actually passed it. And now I was comfortable again. I was being productive. I was on, on, tra on track to becoming a surgeon in the UK. But not losing sight of the plan that I had laid out for myself, I applied to approximately 15 programs in the US. I got five answers. And only one of them was from one of the top 10 I wanted to go into. But I caught a lucky break. Now, I argue that it wasn't luck. It was serendipity. I was actually prepared for it this time. So I went up to Columbia Presbyterian, went to New York, and met this young surgeon from New England who interviewed me and actually liked me. And, and he was amused by my answers, I guess. And one of them, when he asked me what I wanted to do, or what, it, what I was going to do if I didn't get into the program, I answered that I would come back to Columbia and become a farmer, probably plant potatoes. It was true. He thought it was amusing, but it was true. And the reason was, I had a plan. I had a dream. And if you do, you have to lay out a timeline to get there. And the most important part of that is to set yourself time limits. Because otherwise, you would just get frustrated. My time limit was four years. So, this guy, amused as he was by my answer, decided to offer me a one-year spot in a five-year program. All right? That means I still, if I went there, I wasn't sure to stay there for the five years of the training. I was on track in the UK, so they advised that I stayed there. And I decided to take the risk, leave my comfort zone, and go to New York, to Columbia, and prove to them in that year that I could be better than any of the top medical graduates they had taken from the rest of the United States. Now that was cocky, I know. But contrary to three years earlier, I was actually prepared, so I did. I got that spot, and I got to New York City in March of 1993, started working in June of 1993, and I can't begin to explain what it felt like to cross Park Avenue every morning in spring in New York City to go to work. It was probably the sense of accomplishment. Four years in the making, I was finally there. It was just the fact that I had left Birmingham. That could be true too. But it was no walk in the park. I was working as hard as I could, and if all of my counterparts, all of my peers and counterparts got to work at 5.30 in the morning, I would get there at 4.30 in the morning. If they left at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I would leave at 8. And that eventually paid off. A year later, in March of the following year, 1994, I was offered a place to stay there for the, five, for the next five years, and I did. And I met this guy. Now, you might have seen him on TV, Dr. Ross. When I met him, he wasn't this fancy or this you know, famous. He was just a young surgeon, cardiac surgeon, who had just joined the staff of Columbia Presbyterian. And he was as enthusiastic as I was, and I, he got there at the same time I did, so we talked every morning. And he decided that he was going to convince me to become a cardiac surgeon. Sticking to my guns and my plan, I decided that I was not going to let myself be convinced. I wanted to be a liver transplant surgeon, not a cardiac surgeon, but this guy would come into the hospital every morning, look at me in the eye, and go, are you thinking about it yet? And sure, I caved in, you know, six months later, I was convinced. And it was thanks to having an open mind. So I had a plan, but I had, I, my mind was open to better opportunities, and that was the best thing I ever did. I, I, I couldn't be as happy as I am today if I hadn't made that choice. So I applied for a research grant to go into his lab and won, again beating my peers, and became a sheep herder of sorts. This was me, but on a seventh floor, on a twelfth floor in the middle of Manhattan. We operated on sheep, so I had a sheep herd of about 18 of them. We caused them a heart attack, and then fixed the valve that would fail a few weeks later. And working together with a team of biomedical engineers, ended up developing a technique to repair that heart valve without actually having to stop the heart, something that had never been done. And that earned us a patent in the U.S. Patent Office, that you can see there. And that was afterwards produced commercially as a mitra clip, of which 20,000 have been implanted today. Now, my work I presented in 1997 
at the American Heart Association meeting in New Orleans in front of this guy. Uh, you, 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 you don't know who he is, but he was the god of cardiac surgery at the time. Craig Miller. This guy was not only an expert in what I was about to present, he was the guy who knew the most about that in the world. So I was a little bit nervous. Came in with my slide tray under my arm. You know, these things, I don't know if you've seen them before, but they get stuck all the time, they're terrible. But I had been preparing for this, I had my slides ready, I had tested them, everything was working fine. So I started giving my talk, and as I was doing it, you know, two and a half minutes into it, things were flowing, everything was going just fine, and suddenly, boom. Everything went dark, the thing got stuck, of course. So I asked them to please turn a light on me, and proceeded to explain with my hands, as a 3D model, what I had been doing for the past year and a half, to try and explain a, a concept that could potentially change cardiac surgery by just moving my hands in front of an audience. Now, that could have been a disaster, but it actually worked out all right. It was so much so that Craig Miller afterwards offered me a spot to train in cardiothoracic surgery at Stanford. Easy decision, right? Beautiful place, great weather, even better than New York City. It wasn't that hard though. I was, I was settled in my comfort zone for real. I was successful, I was happy. New York was great. But I did it, and I did it for one reason, and one reason only. It was that I believed and felt that by going and training at Stanford, I could become the best cardiac surgeon I could ever be. And that wouldn't have been true in New York, I still believe it today. So I got to Stanford and started working there 100 hours a week, and I'm not kidding, and that was just not a good day. And the best thing that ever happened to me happened to be there. My son was born, Felipe, some of you might know him. He's not that cute anymore. <laughs> and three years later, I was graduating from Stanford, started getting job offers from University of Southern California, University of Texas, Columbia University, uh, a couple of private practice places, all of them great offers, really. And none of them treat me more than the call I got from this guy, Renaldo Cabrera, from a rinky-dink hospital in Bogota, Colombia, Fundación Cardio Infantil. I went to all these places, fancy, they, they would send a limo to pick you up at the airport, it was great, you felt really important. I got here, nobody picked me up at the airport, not even my parents. <laughs> But I got to that place, the Fundación Cardio Infantil, this, this little hospital to your left, and felt that if I came back, I could really make a difference. I could really make a change. It was by far the least economically advantageous, but I felt I could really change that place and the world around it. The image on your right is the Fundación Cardio Infantil today. And you do, you can. I will ask you a team member. Today we're ranked sixth among Latin American hospitals. We're the third largest heart, heart surgery program in Latin America. We have the largest bowel repair center in Colombia. And we do a few things that are innovative. So you can, you can change your world, you can change the world around you, but I realized by putting together this talk that the only way you can change your country is if you're able to become the best in the world before coming back. And the potential of a country like Colombia can only be realized if those who, like you, have the opportunity to go abroad train, get the best education, be exposed to different cultures, different abilities, different intellects, and more importantly, work ethics, to then have the courage to leave your comfort zone and come back to change a country that has everything to be done for it. Now, remember this though, you can only change your country if you're qualified to change the world. Thanks very much.